Father, we just thank you for your goodness in our life. Thank you for your presence with us today. Lord, even I share about you and about your work in our life. Show us, Lord, your design, your purpose of work in our life. We ask, Lord, for your presence. We give you permission to lead guides and do any kind of renovation you need to do in our hearts. We just want to thank you, praise you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, work. work is something that all of us are involved in. And uh, specifically, I like to talk about what is it like to be spirit-led, to do a spirit-led work. I'm sharing this not because I'm an expert. I started working when I graduated from university in 1982, so a little bit over 40 years ago. But I'm sharing because I think I failed more than a lot of other people. I tell people that I think I've been to hell a few times and back because when I first got started, my idea as a young person was I need to go to school because everybody goes to school and I got educated, then I need to find a job so that I get some experience. Then I try to be proficient in what I do. Then I will have wisdom and success. And that was pretty straightforward. I thought everybody understand that, and I did. And uh, as I started work, within a year, all, the only goal I had was to make a lot of money. And within a year, I made a lot of money. But soon after that, I lost it all. And I've shared this in the past. I, my life had been a roller coaster. And um, in desperation, uh, after working for about 12, 13 years in 1995, I lost everything. And desperately, I went to God. And that was the first time I realized I had, known, I had started going to church from kindergarten, but I never knew God. And I started reading the Bible, and I started to discover what I thought was logical, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, will give you success. But if you read in the book of Proverbs, you will find there, God actually started everything. He said, if you're starting a business, you're starting a home, uh, just follow his model. God started with wisdom, then understanding, and then knowledge. That was the first time I understood why my life was such a mess. And um, so we're going to talk about work. But before we do that, there are two words I want us to spend a few moments and think about it. One is called gospel. The other one is called faith. What is your definition of the gospel? If you're like me or majority of Christian, if I ask you, have you heard the gospel? When was the last time you shared the gospel? Chances are your definition of the gospel is about Jesus coming to die for me and his blood was shed to take away my sin so that when I die, I will go to heaven. And that is not wrong, but it's only half right. You know that half right is equal to 100% wrong. You're going to get lost. The other word I want you to think about is faith. This is something that sometimes, oftentimes, we become overly familiar with the word faith. People said, okay, I am going in to invest in that business by faith. I'm going to quit my job by faith. I'm going to go to the mission field by faith. I'm going to go full time by faith. What is your understanding? What's your definition? Because it will affect on your application of it. The Bible is, doesn't have a moving definition uh, of, of the word faith. So this is something, spend a bit of time, think about it. If you can, write them down in the next week. How often do you use the word faith and how do you apply it? And today we'll go, we're going to go and, um, and explore. Um, I've shared before, the book of Genesis chapter 1 is a record of creation. God created everything and he recorded it in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. On the sixth day, God created man. All his creation was good. After he created man, he said it was very good. And chapter 2 of Genesis is a detailed account of day 6, and that involves us. And in this chapter, he does talk about work. Let's just, um, I'm going to go through a few verses um, just to establish the base. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 8. God say, Now the Lord God has planted a garden in the east in Eden that he had formed. There he put the man. 
Let's pause for a while and picture this. God created everything. On day six, he created man. And he said, this is very good. And he put the man in the garden. Adam was in the garden. Where was God? God was with Adam. And God is with Adam 24 hours a day. In verse 2 of uh, Genesis, it says, By the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. This is a picture of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not that you don't do anything. The Sabbath is a picture of God resting because he's finished, he's completed everything you need. In the book of Peter, it says, we have got everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. Everything you need is provided for. God created man on the sixth day and he's with Adam and he rested. Then, let's go to the next verse. Gen uh, Genesis 2 verse 15. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and he put Adam in the garden. God was with Adam. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. This is the first mention of the word work. This is God design and purpose of work. The word work in the Hebrew, it says, it means ergon. It gives the picture of a manager or a steward. When God created the garden, he didn't give the title deeds to Adam so he can buy and sell and make money in property trading. God say, work it, steward it, manage it. I'll be your partner. I am right here. I'm available to you 24-7. Then he actually told Adam, go and name all the animals. Do you think you will be able to name all the animals when it was the first time you see them? But God was with Adam. That's the picture you really need to catch. God was with Adam. And God said, work it. I'll partner you, you if you partner me. Name all these animals. And as you work, as you tend the garden, whenever you have any problem, I am with you. Today, as a born-again believer, where is God? God is not only with you, God is in you. Do you even know that? Now, that's my definition, my new definition of the word gospel. Salvation is part of the gospel. But salvation is only needed after Adam disobeyed God. So if your definition of the gospel is that Jesus died for my sins so that I can go to heaven when I die, then the gospel is only available after the fall. But gospel is a good news from a good God. Is God a good God from the beginning or is he a good God after the fall only? If he's a good God from the beginning, then what is the gospel? I'd like to propose to you that the gospel is about God it being with us. God available to us 24-7. Now, what did Adam do? Adam disobeyed God. God told him earlier, he said, Genesis 2.17, God actually showed Adam, earlier God showed Adam there are two trees in the garden. There's tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. But in verse 17, he said, from all the tree you can eat, but this one tree you must not eat from. It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The purpose and design of work is so that you can find food to eat. You know when Hokkien people, when they meet, what do, how do they greet each other? Is it possible Adam was Hokkien? I don't know. Possible. <laughs> but the purpose of work is you find food to eat. But God said, this tree you must not eat. Now, this is a statement of love. You know, those who have young children, if your children disobey you, you do not just get a cane and cane them. They will be angry with you if you never told them what are the rules of engagement. But when you tell them, these are the behavior I expect of you, but if you disobey me, it's going to get you one cane or two, two strokes of cane. Now, this is not a trap. This is a statement of love. 
unless a child know what the boundary he has, he will never have the security to grow up uh, uh, securely. So work was meant to be a joy because in the, in the book of Psalms, it says, in your presence, in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. When you know the gospel means God is with you. And when you go to work, there'll be many challenges. But when you have God with you, you're going to find joy. But since Adam disobeyed God, and God already told him, if you eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. What does spiritual death mean? Spiritual death means you're separated from God. If the gospel means God is with us, and disobedience by Adam caused God to be separated from man, then what Jesus did by dying on the cross has now made it possible for God to be with man again. Today, for us, the gospel is Emmanuel. God is with us. But it is no good to know God is with you, but you don't know how to benefit from it. If somebody, if you got a grandfather who leave you a $100 million uh, bank account in your name, it will do you no good if you don't know how to take the money out and use it. The gospel is God is with us, but we must know what is the use and how to benefit from it. So, because of this obedience, in Genesis 3.17, it reads this, Curse is the ground because of you, Adam, and through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Work was meant to be a joy, but now it becomes toil. You have to work hard just to make ends meet. How many of you can identify with that? You know, I have... Uh, work I have exp I can identify fully because I um, I I failed so many times and uh, I have known people who need two or three jobs just to make ends meet and that's because of this toil but because of what Jesus did on the cross that made it possible for God to be with us again we do not have to be limited to work by toiling we can still access that joy because joy is available in the presence of the Lord. But His presence alone is not going to make you any difference unless you know how to access it. God is available to you and He's a living God. All you need to have to do, like what Adam did was ask Him what to do, how to do it, when to do it. When you learn how to do that, you no longer have to be subjected to toil. You can actually access joy again. So I have a new definition of faith. Faith is to do what God says to do. And I received this from Romans 8 verse 3, when God took the children of Israel into the wilderness to test what is in their heart. Do you trust me? And God said to them, Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, present stance from the mouth of God. He's got to be a living God for you to be able to, re to hear His voice, to, to eat from every word that proceeds from His mouth. In the book of uh, Exodus 33, when Moses wanted to know from God. This is what he says. In Exodus 33, verse 13 to 14, he said, um, Moses told God, God, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And it's very interesting. If I go to Alan, Alan, show me the way. How do you do this Petra app? What do you think Adam will do? He will take out his phone and show me what to do step by step, correct? But when Moses went to God, God, show me your way. You know what he said? My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. Remember Genesis 2 verse 2? God completed all his work and he rested. 
He is with Adam. He's available to Adam 24-7. That is our Sabbath rest that is available to us. God rested. Show me your way, Lord. And God say, my presence is with you. What are your challenges in your work today? Do you know that you have a so uh, access to the solution 24-7? There's, there's a scripture in the Bible say, let us labor to enter that rest. Again, that rest is the Sabbath rest. God rest, not your rest. Rest is not inactivity. Rest is not I go up to the mountain, I meditate and hear from God. Rest is not about I go to the beach and have my pina colada with a small umbrella. Rest is not inactivity. Rest is Holy Spirit directed activity. How do we labor to enter that rest? The Bible says that rest, not a rest, but that rest. John 15 verse 7 says this. If you remain in me, if you put your trust with me, I, I so love uh, Sister Violet sharing just now. You know, she actually, in, in all her sharing, did you catch that she was actually resting on God? She was running to God. What she had not shared is, what does she do in between? What does she do take today? I wouldn't be surprised if she's a person of the word. I wouldn't be surprised if the person who spent time with God. Knowingly, unknowingly, she was laboring to enter that rest. But often in a sharing like that, we only hear the end result. Ah, oh, the next time you have trouble, oh, I just trust God, trust God, trust God. But the Bible says, let us labor to enter that rest. John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me, if you put your trust in me, keep on coming to me, and my word remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. If you remain in me, and in original word, my word here, my rema word, my spoken word, my voice, remain in you. Whatever you ask for, in Jesus' name, will be done unto you. Verse 8 says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples. Disciples is not something you make. Disciples come from people copying who you are because they are so impressed that they see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. How does the fruit of the Spirit grow in your life? By you putting your trust in God, going to God, going to God, going to God. God is with you is the gospel. Faith is you do whatever he tells you. You keep going to God. Lord, I've got this problem. Lord, how come thing is turning out that way? Lord, what do I do with this situation? If you go to him, you wait upon him, and he will tell you one word, and you do it. That is the gospel work by faith. God created us. He wants to nourish us and to cherish us you see that you see that in the book of Ephesians. god's design purpose from the very beginning is to bless us work is meant to be joy and a blessing you know and as a new believer i actually came across these blessings of god in deuteronomy 28 verse 3 to 13. I even memorized it. I was doing so badly. I was failing in everything I was doing. I thought I was, I, I'm, I'm really a bad guy, you know. I, I just wanted to make money so I can protect and bless my family. But how come I kept getting into trouble? But in desperation, I ran to God. And then I was taught this. You know, God wants to bless you. Do you know that his design is to bless you? Some of, some of the content, you, you need to go and take a look at the blessing. It says, blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed will you be in the country. You'll be blessed when you come in. When you go out, your enemies will come to you one way and they will flee seven ways. You shall lend to many nations. You will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. I read it. I read it. I memorized it. If you come to my home today, I have a floor mat that say, blessed coming in, blessed going out. I try to memorize it every day. But it did not become a reality in my life. I was failing in everything I do with all good intention there was. Do you know why? Very often, 
in the body of Christ. A lot of teaching and preaching out of good intention, people learn motivational uh, 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 messages instead of the truth. This blessing, this is in the Bible. This is God's intention for us. This will be the fruit. But take a look at verse 1 and 2. What does it say? And this is what I should be memorizing on. It says, blessed, no, wrong one. Now it shall come to pass if, when there's a if mean it's a precondition, it's a prerequisite. You want to get all those blessings, but there's something that must happen first. He said, now it shall come to pass if you diligent obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today. And verse 2 say, all these blessings in verse 3 to 13, all these blessings not only come upon you, it will overtake you. It will be waiting for you. Do you believe that? But what is the precondition? Because you obey the voice of the Lord, you're gone. Instead of spending time memorizing the blessing, I should be finding out how do I hear the voice of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When I found out about this, I spent time. So what I'm sharing here today is something that I've been working on for the last 25 years. I have felt, I, I, I really mean it, I have felt more than a lot of people. I've been to hell a few times and back. But I can tell you, these words are the truth. God is a good God, and He's a good God from the beginning. He was not, he's not only a good God after the fall. The gospel is about God is with you and He's available to you 24-7. But do you know how to access His presence? What is the benefit of having His presence? Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest. His presence is available to you. And Mark 12, 29, if you heard my messages before, it should not be new to you. That Jesus when asked, which one is the most important commandment? And Jesus said, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel. Shema, O Israel. The Lord God is our God. Then the, the Lord is one. There's no other one. Now, I just want to pause a little bit and you... You've got to catch this picture. God was with Adam. Today, God is with you and God is in you. That's the gospel. What is faith? Faith is to do what he tells you to do, which means you need to learn and figure out how to hear his voice. And I've shared uh, in, in a few occasions earlier this year on about hearing God's voice. I was actually sharing with my son recently, I shared with some people. You guys know about Peter walking on water? What do you think is the cause? What enables people, uh, Peter to walk on water? You know, for many years, I tried to figure it out. And one of the things that I, I come to believe, Peter walked on water because he fixed his eyes on Jesus. Because... When he turned his eyes to the storm, he started to sink. So I thought, the reason Peter could want water, because he fixed his eyes on Jesus. If that is the answer, then it really depends on Peter's faith, Peter's ability to focus. Then the focus is on Peter. But what if the reason he could walk on water, because he heard Jesus said, Come. Faith is about doing what you hear God tells you to do. Amen. I wonder how many of you here, maybe a quick show of hand, how many of you know what is your calling? Wow, not bad. Five, six, not bad. What is the difference between a calling and a gift? In Mark 
1:17, Jesus said, "Follow me; I will make you fishers of men." Now, although we have access to the blessings of God, to the presence of God, but we are living in this fallen world. The sinful nature is inside us. Very often, when people say, "See, follow me; I will make fish, you fishers of men," we just figure, "Okay, how?" What does it mean to be fishers of men? Oh, I need to go out and share the gospel. I must bring people to the kingdom of God. I must evangelize. So we focus on how to become fishers of men. It becomes a work of the flesh, which can be done and achieved without depending on Jesus. If Peter walk on water, depending on his ability to focus, it can be done without depending on Jesus. You can become a very successful fishers of men without depending on Jesus, but you cannot become a follower of Jesus without depending on Jesus. So your definition, understanding, and application of gospel and faith will determine the outcome. Will determine your walk with the Lord. In the book of uh, Corinthians, First uh, uh, Corinthians chapter fourteen, it says this: Pursue love, desire gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. This is where I want to differentiate between calling and gifts. All of us have the same calling. We are called to follow Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus without depending on Jesus. But many make mistakes. We all have different gifts. And we mistake our gifting, our talent, as our calling. I am an extrovert. I like meeting people. When sometimes I'm in the office, I, I feel my battery is drained out. I will call up a few people. I will have coffee. I will have lunch. I am all charged up again. So in my job in banking, actually involve selling. So I used to think my calling is to be in the marketplace, to be in sales. But actually, that is not my calling. That is my giftings. No, but in First Corinthians fourteen, God say, "Pursue love. What is love? Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Those are all fruit of the spirit. Singular. But desire gifts, miracles, healing, uh, prophecy. Those are all gifts. But many believers." Unknowingly chase after giftings. You know why? Because gifts are more spectacular. Can you imagine if I lay hands on people and they get healed? I lay hands on the dead and they, start, they they wake up. Whatever I say come true. Many of us pursue that, but God say pursue love, because fruit requires you to work with Jesus. To follow Him, you need to depend on Him. Fruit is only produced. By doing what he tells you to do, for the fruit of the spirit to be available in your life, it has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the spirit is one fruit with nine different segments, just like a mandarin orange. But you said, okay, today I think I need to work on my patience. Somebody drive and cut in front of me. Patient, patient, patient. Lord, give me patience now. That becomes a work of the flesh. It looks like, it looks like uh, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit cannot be achieved by you. The fruit of the spirit only come as you hear him and you obey him. Faith is doing what God tells you to do. Present tense. Now, very often, when I share about the blessing of God, and especially in my life. It involves financial blessing. It involves money, but I find some people actually have an aversion to that because there have been quite a little bit of of、um, teaching in the body of Christ that gone a little bit overboard. It become a pros. They call people call it prosperity gospel. So yes, it's true. The blessing of God is much more than money. It can involve health, protection, authority. Anointing, but money is still very important. You know,、uh, for all Jesus' teaching while he was on earth, money is one topic that he talked about 
single topic that he talked about more. He talked more about uh, prayer, about fasting, about healing, money. Why? Why? Yes, there are other spiritual blessings. Let's read from uh, Luke 16, uh, verse 10 to 11. He said, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And verse 11 says, So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, money, who can trust you with true riches? It is God's plan, God's heart, to want to bless you with much more than money. But you cannot pass that test. You cannot get to that stage unless you can be trusted with the little money. Whether you are a pastor, you're a missionary, you're a banker, you're a lawyer, you're an engineer, all, you're a housewife, you are a mother. All of us get involved with money. All of us get involved with work. Work is meant to be a joy, but it's not for you to do it on your own. God did not create Adam and give him some big bank account and go and live on your own. God said, I am with you 24-7. Whatever you are facing today, if you are born again and you are born of water and spirit, you have access to every solution you could possibly need. Do you dare to believe that? Money is not the most important thing. Actually, according to the word of God, it's the least. Worldly wealth is the least. But we need to be faithful with this. So that through your work, needing to earn money to eat, your character can be formed. Your character can be formed through you learning to be willing and to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. Your character, I don't know, we've got a lot of ladies here. Ladies love diamonds, right? You know the stone diamond? You know why it's so expensive? And what is a good diamond? An expert stone carter, and I, I googled this, a good diamond is a little stone you can shave and cut, and a good one you can have up to 53 different surfaces. Smooth surfaces, when the light shines on it, it will shine back. But can you imagine you have a diamond and you have to carry it around to show to people, look at my diamond. You don't. You want to have a casing to, to sit on, for it to sit on. That casing is your character. God needs you to understand work is from Him for your joy so that character can be formed on you so that He can put on it true riches, the anointing of God. God wants you to be his temple, to be his mobile temple. The time is coming when God needs to mobilize his mobile temple all around the world as we're reaching the, the end time. So you are his prized possession, but he needs to build his character on you so he can put his anointing on you. What is required of a steward to work with God? A steward need, is required only to do one thing, to be faithful. So your definition of faith will make a huge difference on how you can become a good steward. Faith is about hearing God and do what He tells you to do. And Romans 14, 23 says, whatever that is not from faith is sin. I tell you, the first time I read it, I got really angry. <laughs> How can you say everything? You know, don't I have faith? Money is God's idea. But it's not just for you to depend on it. Money makes a great servant. God makes a good God. The day when you, have, when you have more money and you start to depend on money as a source of power, as a supplier of everything you need, God will become your servant. God say you choose who is your God today. In Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, I uh, made a mention of this earlier. God actually said that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. And then in verse 18 of the same chapter, 
God say, you shall remember the Lord your God because it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, the power to create wealth so that He can promise the covenant He cut with Abraham. That power to create wealth is to test you, to see to, if your character is ready, if you come to maturity where He can put His anointing on you because you are His temple, His mobile temple. The time is coming, the time is very near when God needs to mobilize his body. You know, when God took the children of Israel, they were in Egypt, they were in bondage. God took them out of Egypt. Now, leaving Egypt is not the, 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 the completion of a journey. It's actually the beginning of a journey. How many of you remember the Passover when the spirit of death went through Egypt and killed every firstborn son in the land but those who put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost the spirit of death will pass over them and we celebrate that God said you celebrate every year until he comes back and we celebrate but we sometimes forget as if it is the arrival of a journey. It's the completion of a journey. The Passover is the beginning of a journey. Having God's presence is only half a journey. But you need to learn to discern His voice. Then you do what He tells you to do. No matter what challenges you face, nothing is too difficult for God. Let us labor to enter that rest. You know what is that rest? That rest is actually is the promised land. We have a God who tells us the end from the beginning. God say, I will make known to you the end from the beginning. As if what is written in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation is actually have been made known to you in the book of Genesis. How is that even possible? Because God say, my presence is all you need. Come to me. Listen to me and do what I tell you to do. The rest actually is the promised land. God is taking us out of Egypt to take us into the promised land. The promised land is not something far, far away in the future. The promised land is in your heart. Is your character ready? So when you face challenges in your life, look forward to it. Lord, do what you want to do in my heart. Teach me how to hear your voice. Give me the courage, boldness, to do what I just heard you tell me to do. The land is cursed. That's why people end up toiling. You know, as a, as a, uh, as a pre-believer, in the old days, I used to, to, before I become a believer, I said, you know, if God is so powerful, I hear, you know, Christian always talk about how good their God is. How can it be possible when there's so much killing, so much war going on? What is going on? Where is this God? And I've, I've come to know people who struggle and struggle in their work. Some people have to work three jobs just to make ends meet. What's, what's, what's wrong with this picture? What is God? And it, this, this hit Christian and non-Christian, you know. And sometimes the non-believer seems to be doing better than the believers. Although if you go to Psalm 73, you will see that it will not end well with them. But knowing that it will not end well with non-believers doesn't help my case if I don't have solution to my problems. You know, I, I just read in Manipur in India, you know, since May, the last three, four months, you know that 300 churches have been burned down? Where is God in all this? Mm. I'd like to invite you to check your definition, understanding, and application of the word gospel and the word faith. In the book of Psalm 81, verse 13 and 14, this is what God says. If my people would only listen, shema me, would only listen to what I say and do what I say. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways. Remember Moses asked God, Lord, show me your ways. God said, my presence is with you. 
How quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hands against their foes. Nothing is too difficult for God. Whatever challenges you are facing is not too difficult for God. What Sister Violet said just now, it was just so timely and so wonderful. But you know, you can listen to a testimony like that and say, wow, God is good. And she got so much uh, increment, bonus, and all that money. So we only focus on the end product. Recently, I heard of a story, a true story, uh, a businessman and a, a preacher of the gospel. And uh, they bump into each other at the airport. And this businessman say, oh, pastor, do you remember me? He said, sorry, I don't remember. Can you, can you help me remember? He said, we met about 30-something years ago in my country. And I was so down. My business was so bad. I have only $1,000 to my name. That's all I have left. Things were so bad. And then you came. I was attended, attended your meeting. And I heard God tell me to give money into your ministry. To give $1,000. And I didn't want to hear that. So I didn't do anything. Then God told me again. So reluctantly, he went to the table where the, the preacher was signing his book. Take one book and give the last thousand dollars he had in this world. And he said, you know what happened the next day? Somebody who owed me money which have written off suddenly came up to me and paid me back ten thousand dollars. Hallelujah. And today when they met over 30 years later, his business is thriving and he's doing really well. You know when you hear a testimony like that, what do you hear? Unfortunately, very often, people get so excited Preacher, preachers and teachers who say, you see, you see, you sow, you give God a thousand, you will get ten thousand. God will bless you thirty, sixty, a hundred times. Do you dare to be bold? That's not being bold. Or people say, you see, if you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. If you keep sowing and sowing, God will never leave you alone. But what actually happened here I want and this is a true story as I was re reading about this story I actually saw it the man was in a meeting he heard God said give away give him a thousand dollars and the guy obeyed now if I focus on the other stories of course it's it's a true story it's already happened but if I'm conscious of becoming fishers of men instead of following Jesus, I may become a very successful fisher of men without depending on Jesus. And that's not the gospel. Is it possible that is where we went off track? Is it possible that is why our train are in a wreck? Our life is in a mess. Is it possible why work becomes so difficult? God wants to bless us beyond our imagination to Him who is able to do abundantly above all you can imagine or ask. Work is a ministry. Whether you are a lawyer, you are a mother, you are a housewife, you are a missionary, you are a pastor, you are a painter, you are an author, whatever it is, it is a ministry. It is spirit-led, if it is spirit-led. Isaiah 46.10, we must understand that God say, I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is yet to come? Not only is a joy you know you have all the solution you need, God will even tell you what is coming. You know we're in the end time. God already said that things will be bad. They'll be shaking. Once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth until those that cannot be shaken will remain. So we've just been through a very, very difficult period of COVID. But when I hear people, preachers warning people, you know what we've just gone through? It is not the worst. You know, the worst is coming. It will be really bad. I don't get encouraged. And I... I and, and when it starts to put people in fear, I don't think it's of God. God already tells you what is going to happen. But God already told you from the beginning. I make known the end from the beginning. Moses said, God, show me your way. God said, my presence will be with you. 
what's your definition, understanding, implication of the gospel, of the word faith? When the, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. So in wrap up, work is a ministry if it's led by the Holy Spirit. We all have the same calling, which is to follow Jesus. But we all have different giftings. Do not mix up your talent, your giftings with your calling. You follow Jesus. He will show you. You will figure out what is your, what is your, what is your giftings. And somehow you, you, move, you can move very easily. The danger of mixing up your calling with your gifting is because you've been gifting, gifted and wired and created by God with that talents, you can actually do very well depending on yourself. But you may not be following God. Gifts are given to you free, no charge. But it comes with a responsibility. What is that responsibility? To steward it. And to be a steward, one thing is required of you, to be faithful. Faith defined as doing what you hear God tells you to do. And with that, the fruit of the Spirit will come through your life. It is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. You know what's the byproduct of that? You become His disciples. And wherever you go, when people start to see Jesus through you, they want to be like you. That's how you make disciples. So work is a good thing. But when you try to perform your work, not depending on God, it becomes the work of the flesh. But when you learn to follow His leading, because He is with you, you start, He starts to be allowed to produce His fruits through your life. Then suddenly you find yourself back in the joy of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your good news. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to make it possible for God to be with us again, to even live with us, lead guide, to lead us and guide us. So that, Lord, even as we go through this life, in our work, our character may be formed by you. We will start to mature, to be matured by you, so that you can flow freely through our lives. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.